respects that mandate and what we have here are policies, things being done by the board which are outside, in my view, the mandate. Can I kind of, because the parliamentary you, mandate. You use plural there, Jen, and we refer to both of us. I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to re, I'm remain, I take a position, but I'm trying to be nonpartisan about it, and I mean that. I had on my board a distinguished conservative, former MLA from Alberta. He was known for his human rights. He was on my board. Never once did he try to make a partisan uh, issue the government of, of when I had a conservative government that we should ever follow a, a conservative agenda. He stuck to the human rights mandate. And to get back to David Mathis, I as an NDP, we haven't exactly formed a government yet at the federal level. <laughs> but if I were our prime minister, I'd love to appoint a liberal to do my dirty work instead of uh, someone in my own party. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't, if you have Mr. Mattis, never to my memory has he criticized, has he come to the defense of Palestinians and has always defended very often very offensive actions by the government of Israel, why not, why wouldn't uh, the government put Mr. Mattis on and say, well, look, he's a liberal. Uh, my point earlier was you put people on, doesn't matter what party label they have, that you know will pursue their agenda. What, what you two men are saying is anybody who disagrees with you is a partisan. No, and, uh, and no, you're not. Saying, well, no. That's, that's, that's an amazing that's position. That's not correct. We're saying if you disagree with the mandate, we had conservatives, we had NDP on the board, they respected the mandate of the organization, which is, I say, an, a governance imperative that you act in accordance with the International Bill of Human Rights. That's your governing imperative. You do not act with respect to protecting certain states from, from criticism or, 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 or criticizing other states that don't deserve it. You use the International Bill of Human Rights as, your, as, your, uh, as, as the standard. By the way, when you appoint a speaker in the House of Commons, once he becomes speaker, he leaves his politics behind. It's the same with the people on the board. Of, uh, they should I'm be sorry, on the board that's all of right Are you both that's saying that this is this really round. all about Israel? Is gonna, that what you're saying? We're going to move. Uh, is much that what of you're it saying? Is, I would say thank, yes, much of it thank is. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. That's wrong. We're going to move to Mr. Dewar for the last, uh, well, I won't say the last word, but certainly the last round. Yeah. Right. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, we could take longer. Um, Chair, I just wanted to start off by, I think one of the things that needs to be put on the table here is uh, that, that was referenced but needs to be reinforced, and that is that uh, Mr. Beauregard uh, worked for, you know, NDP premiers, um, liberals, and conservatives, and, you know, Mr. Harris, who, you know, I'll never be accused of supporting in any way, shape, or form. But I will certainly observe that Mr. Beauregard was able to work with Mr. Harris on the issue of, of, uh, of human rights. And it, it, it is telling that when it comes to this affair, we have someone who is able to work with anyone not able to work with this particular board. And I say that as an observation because I think some would like to have this be structured as well, the board came in to deal with a, a crisis and a problem. And I would make the observation is that the crisis was created by these members, and it's very evident here. I mean, after we've heard, I mean, I go back to the, la the testimony uh, of the board members that, um, and others that, you know, they were not only micromanaging, but they were having their hands in, in changing the minutes. I think of the Durban uh, example, where uh, you know it was I never refuted by Mr. Braun that he actually asked to have the minutes changed, but changing the record to reflect that it wasn't the board, or sorry, it wasn't the president and the staff who had made the recommendation not to go to Durban too, that it was him. That we have now uh, examples this morning from uh, the previous witnesses that we're giving contracts to fellow board members. Um, Mr. Beauregard, according to this committee, according to the Attorney General, according to the Department of Foreign Affairs, was doing everything in concert with what he, his role, his mandate was. And I have to agree with the recommendations that have been made that we need to do, uh, obviously, something immediately. And we can discuss as a committee what they are. 
I would use a medical analogy. We have to do triage first to save the patient, and then we have to make sure that the patient is whole and healthy. But clearly, we have to do something. To do nothing is, is, is not an option. So I, I would ask uh, Mr. Amon, in your experience, when you had uh, to deal with, um, uh, about when there was evaluation sorry, done by the board of you, were you always made aware of, of the uh, evaluations before they were finished and signed off? Did you participate in that process? Well, they, they prepared the evaluation, but they would show them to me, and I never tried to change them, I just let them go. Right, but you, you were aware yeah. of what was in the evaluation. And, uh, when, and, but they were discussed by the entire board. It wasn't done by a small committee of the board. They, the small committee might have prepared the initial document. I remember, can remember very well, I was asked to leave the room when they discussed my evaluation, and I leave, left the room, and I was later showed the evaluation. I had no problem with it. Um, okay. I Same mean, with I, they were free to make whatever evaluation. <laughs> I might say my, the evaluation was positive every year. Uh, so, uh, of course, even having seen it, I, I, uh, I didn't have too much to disagree with. But there wasn't a separate process, is my point. No, no. And you were, but, you were made aware of what the evaluation as was. As I pointed out, there was never, I, never an attempt by the chair. By the, I had three chairs. Uh, one was Maureen O'Neill. The next one was Lois Wilson. The next one was uh, Kathleen Mahoney. Um, they, uh, you know, they were strong personalities, and they... Uh, and they, each one of them uh, brought the evaluation when, they, when, time, when the time came to the full board. The full board discussed it and approved it, then they sent it Same on. Same with you, Mr. Broadbent? Yes. Okay. Um, Chair, I say that because clearly there is a, a change in the way that the evaluations um, have been done in the past and what we have right now. I, I think the, the appointments process, and I have to maybe disagree a little bit uh, with my friend Mr. Abbott, um, you know, we were consulted, for instance, on the appointment of Mr. Latulip, and we're going to hear about him uh, on, on Thursday, but uh, as far as I know, no one agreed to his appointment, and he was appointed. And I think further to that, and I want to get our witness's opinion, you know, I, I, I am someone who has a, a conflict of interest when it comes to the Public Appointments Commission because I was on the committee for Bill C-2, the Accountability Act, where we made amendments to have a Public Appointments Commission. It gets a million dollars a year, uh, but it, uh, alas, has no real process other than the PMO. And so nothing has changed other than there's a million dollars there for the government to dispense of appointments at their will. And I, I note that yesterday that became a problem because one of uh, the appointments made uh, to the uh, IDRC has become a problem because of whom, whom, uh, which commission she sits on is a conflict of interest in, in, uh, in the view of the Gates Foundation. But I, I think at least in this period that we should have this committee to be able to question appointees before they are appointed uh, to the board and as president, and would that not be, uh, you mentioned, I think, Mr. Broadbent, that at least to confer with the leaders, and I think Mr. Amon said the same, uh, we could do that, or we could also have this committee question uh, the appointees as well, in light of the fact we don't have a public appointments commission. Would that be another well, way of doing it? I, I, I'd separate it out. I, as I said, my, my, I have a real concern about uh, the staff, and the continuing credibility of rights and democracy when you have, and we, you're going to talk about Mr. Latouli, that kind of man who is, who is president and Mr. Brown is chairman. I think some immediate action is needed to change the chairperson. Um, and I'm not sure you'll get a rapid agreement by a whole committee of the, of the House on that person. But for other appointees that are going down or other steps that would be good of this committee of, you know, cross-party lines could do it. That's why I said um, it seemed to me maybe the most efficacious uh, if the committee recommended that for a start, the chairperson who is responsible for every, all the other activity going on ultimately and to this, this committee, if he, he was replaced, then I would hope that the Prime Minister would agree to sit down with Mr. Ignatieff and Mr. Dusep and Mr. Layton and, and, and let's say, let's, let's get a Canadian man or a woman now that no one's going to dispute as integrity on an interim basis and may, and, and to get them in there so that the, to restore faith in the, in the staff, 
and to bring some order, and it will be difficult, I think, to the existing board still, until longer range.